uh, what I thought I'd talk about in this section was about the Elementary Pharmabiotic Centre, something a centre that some of you may have heard of, uh, which is based in Cork, and I'm speaking on behalf of my colleagues at the APC here. Now, the APC started in 2003, and we've been very often asked, how do you set up something like the APC? How do you generate something like the APC? And unfortunately, the answer is just luck. It's just serendipity. We were very lucky that back in 2003, we had a group of scientists and clinicians at UCC who were all friends. We knew each other, we went for coffee together, we talked about problems together, and then the Irish government announced a scheme for funding large centres. And so we got together and we put in a grant application for this large centre grant. But we didn't recruit anybody new, we didn't bring anybody who wasn't already there. So we were just very lucky that we had gastroenterologists, psychiatrists, nutritionists, neuroscientists, microbiologists, who happened to enjoy each other's company and we submitted this uh, large grant. Now one of the things we did at that time in 2003 was we made up a new word. So we made up the word pharmabiotics. We didn't want to be the probiotic research center because even 10 years ago the word probiotic was already being abused a lot in the literature and in the media. And so we didn't want to be a probiotic center, we wanted to be a pharmabiotic center. And we defined pharmabiotics as anything that you derive from the microbiota which has a pharmacological effect. And that would include, of course, probiotics, but it could include cell uh, fragments, it could include bioactives produced by cells or other agents derived from the gut microbiota. They would have a role in preservation of health or in the therapy of disease. Now, we were lucky, both because we had these people present in Cork already, but also because the microbiota was an area which was just about to explode. In 2003, when the APC started, this is the number of publications that were published every year with the word microbiota. And so we're about 200 publications a year. It was an area that was in existence, obviously, but it wasn't very uh, popular. And this is what happened in the last 10 years. Now, of course, this isn't because the APC came along. We were just part of this explosion of interest. But we have contributed over a 1,000 papers on microbiota-related topics in the 10 years that we've been in existence. So we were lucky to, to kind of be on the crest of that wave of interest in the microbiota. And, of course, that's been reflected, as everybody knows, in all the, condition, in all the uh, scientific journals, the economic journals, and in the, the range of different diseases which are now linked to the microbiota or to dysbiosis. We're very fortunate in the people we have. It's a large grant, and we have 160 scientific staff working in the center. You see some of them here. And our investigators, the original 10 people who wrote the grant, has expanded to nearly 50 people. And you can see listed here some of the um, clinical disciplines and the scientific disciplines which are covered by the investigators in the center. And it's important to look at the, the clinical disciplines because these are the people who get us the samples, get us access to patients, and we have people across a whole range of clinical disciplines, from cardiovascular to psychiatry, gerontology, neonatology, uh, metabolic health, and so on. And we've had a bit of a, a competition among the staff trying to get the cover of different journals. So any time we get a paper published, we always submit something for the cover to try and beat our colleagues and get things on the cover. But we've got on the cover of lots of different journals. And maybe the, the most um, renowned publication from the group was uh, just over a year ago now in um, Nature, where we had a paper which showed the correlation between gut microbiota composition diet and health in the elderly. So putting that kind of triumvirate together and showing that in the elderly, as you get inflammaging, you also get uh, reduction in diversity in the microbiota, and you can link that directly to diet and to clinical uh, parameters as well. And that stu study was led by Paul O'Toole, one of the investigators within the center. The structure is kind of boring to anybody who isn't in the center, but basically it's an industry research center. We have to work with industry. The government supplies 70% of the funding, but we must get 30% from industry. And so currently we're funded at a level of about 50 million euros, which is about 5 billion rupees. So it's a large grant. Uh, that's for 2013 to 2019. And the way we build the center is we have 
a core management group. The director is Fergus Shannon, who's Professor of Gastroenterology, Professor of Medicine in UCC. We have platform technologies that you'll all be familiar with, next-gen sequencing, germ-free facilities, um, microbiota handling capabilities, um, bioinformatics, human clinical trials, preclinical models, and so on. And then we have a number of research themes, which are led by some of the PIs. And then, of course, we have industry-specific projects, where an industry comes in and asks us to do something. We do that for that industry, but that is done, if you like, offline, not in the public uh, domain of the center. So the research themes are led by the people you see here. I won't list them. But one research theme, for example, is microbes to molecules. Can we derive mo molecules from microbes? Can we show that a microbe has an impact and then find out which molecule is responsible for the impact? Uh, myself and Paul Ross and Dov and Sindran run that group. With the brain gut axis, and I told you yesterday about some of the results that Ted and John have been getting in how microbes affect brain function. Host microbe is, of course, the interaction with the immune system. And then we're very interested in the extremes of life. We're interested in neonates and in the elderly. And Paula Toole and Catherine uh, run those two uh, ends of the extremes of life. We're also interested in extreme athletes. And the Irish rugby team is one of our study groups. We get uh, samples from the Irish rugby team during their training periods. And we can monitor extreme athletes and how they uh, microbiota corresponds with function. The platform technologies I won't dwell on, but they, you see them there, all the kind of things that you might expect in a center this size. And it's one of the real advantages of having the center is that we have these shared platforms that we have access to and that are then available as well for any projects that we take on. The industry-specific projects I'm not going to tell you about because they're specific to the industries, but we can uh, give you a quick glimpse here at the logos of the different industries that are involved, some of the major multinationals are involved in some smaller local biotech companies as well. So we have a nice mix of uh, food, pharma, diagnostics, veterinary, GE are involved uh, because they're looking at radiation, the impact of radiation uh, on the gut. So we have a lot of different companies involved. But overall, what I wanted to do was rather than just describe the structure of the center, I wanted to give you one example of the kind of science we're doing against one particular target. We have many different targets, but I'm going to choose one target that I'm involved in because I'm a bit more familiar with the work. And we're particularly the strategy of the center, the entire strategy of the center, is that the gut microbiota is a very powerful player in deciding the health of the host. And if that is true, and we believe it to be true, then we should be able to derive interventions from that microbiota and also aim interventions at that uh, niche and, and in that way protect health and, and restore health. And you can range through a level of complexity from fecal transplants, where you transplant the entire fecal microbiota from one individual to another, to microbial consortia, which are defined consortia of many bacteria, through to single strain or multi-strain probiotics, pharmabiotics derived from those probiotics, or even bacteriophages, the viruses that sit in the gut. And I want to just give you a quick example of these. And the target that I'm going to choose for this presentation is the Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea, the disease that causes many deaths in hospital every year. And we know, of course, it, it results from dysbiosis. It results because the antibiotics are used to treat a patient for some other condition. It causes a dysbiosis in the gut, and then the Clostridium difficile can flourish, produce toxins, and lead to very serious disease. And there are, of course, plenty of evidence that the microbiota can uh, be a, an effective therapy for Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. So we in the APC have done fecal transplants. Uh, this is a very recent innovation for us, but we've done a few fecal transplants recently with uh, the same kind of results as have been reported worldwide, uh, almost complete success. And people have literally got out of their beds and, and walked home after uh, one single treatment with a fecal transplant. We are looking at microbial consortia, but I have a small tick there because this is only just beginning. What we're trying to do here is, in similar to Elaine Petroff's work, is derive a standard consortia of bacteria, mixed and complex, but uh, also characterized to treat CDAD. But I wanted to say something about probiotics, given the nature of this meeting. Already yesterday, I pointed out that there is significant evidence that probiotics can work in CDAD. And this example I used yesterday of 
um, the Actimel lactobacillus casei working in a particular hospital setting. And we set out to go the other direction, if you like. Here's a bug and bacterium that already exists and it was used to treat C. diff. But what if we start with C. diff as the target and then try and isolate a bacterium? And it was actually more difficult than we thought. But what we did in this very simple, simple at least to describe experiment, but a very long experiment to do, was we screened over 1,500 individual lactobacilli. These lactobacilli were all isolated from the human gut, but they were all genotyped so that they were all different. We knew all 1,500 were different. And we developed a medium in which both Clostridium difficile and lactobacillus could grow equally well. And then we simply did co-culture experiments. We mixed C. diff and lactobacillus in co-culture, grew them up, and then measured the amount of C. diff at the end of the experiment. One out of 1,500 lactobacilli was capable of killing the C. diff. The other 1,499 were incapable of doing that, in vitro in this model. And here you see the one is here among many. This is among about nine or 10. But of course, this graph, if I showed you all 1,500, would stretch right across the room. Only one was capable of killing the C. diff in a very significant manner. So we selected that one and we tested it in an animal model. The animal model was pre-treated with antibiotic so that the C. diff would infect. This is on day seven after C. diff infection. And if we gave daily, the, the C. diff gives a, a massive infection in these animals. In fact, there were levels of 10 to the nine per gram of feces in the, in the um, mouse feces. But when we feed the, the probiotic, the lactobacillus, either pre and post infection or simply post infection, then we get the sec five to six log reduction in the C. diff carriage in these animals. So we get a significant protective effect against a massive dose of C. diff in these models. And of course, now we need to extend this on to look and see if it works in, in more uh, valid systems, real systems outside of the lab. But it does show that this particular ability to do this is actually quite rare among lactobacilli. So we've shown that fecal transplants can work, we're working on microbial consortia. We know that probiotics can work, and we have a candidate that we want to bring forward into uh, further trials. But what about pharmabiotics? What about products of bacteria, derived from bacteria? One of the things we're very interested in, and I mentioned it briefly yesterday, are bacteriocins, which are produced by bacteria in the gut. Nearly all of the bacteria in the gut have the capability of producing bactericins, and so we know they must be an important ecological driver. And here we have a, a, a particular bactericin, it's a two-component lantibiotic produced by a strain of Lactococcus lactis. Now, Lactococcus lactis, of course, is not normally regarded as a probiotic, but this bactericin has a very broad spectrum, including Clostridium difficile, so it kills Clostridium difficile very effectively. And it's active in nanomolar concentration, so it's about a thousand times more active than classic antibiotics. And what we did was we set up a, a, a human colon model along the lines that developed by um, Glenn Gibson in the University of Reading. So a mock-up mock of the human colon. We infected that with feces, or we, we seeded it with feces, and then we infected it with Clostridium difficile. And then in various different um, targets, we added either the Lactococcus lactis, which could produce this bactericin, or a Lactococcus lactis, which had been engineered not to produce it, or we added the bacteria in itself in different concentrations. We left that go for 24 hours, and then we did a complete genome analysis of the, uh, of the colonic model. And that's what I want to show you here. First, let me show you the impact on C. diff. As we expected, over the 24 hours, the C. diff grew in the control vessel, grew by about one log. And this might mimic C. diff growing in a C. diff-infected patient. Those vessels, those artificial colons that receive the live strain, whether it produced the antibiotic or not, there was no impact on C. diff. And this is maybe not surprising because Lactococcus lactis will not grow in that environment and probably won't produce the bactericin. But the bactericin itself in the two different doses had quite a good effect at reducing the C. diff, reducing it by several logs. And so that looked quite promising. But what we were most interested in was what was happening in the background, what was happening to the rest of the microbiota. And when we did the microbiota analysis, we could see here the classic um, 
Formicutes, Bacteroides, Proteobacteria, Actinobacteria kind of pattern in the uh, feces in this particular vessel. The ones we treated with the Lactococcus lactis were essentially unchanged over time, as we would expect. But those treated with the Bacteriocin, unfortunately, there was a, a huge collateral effect on the microbiota, the big explosion in the number of Proteobacteria present. So we don't think this would be a very good solution. While you're killing the C. diff, which is good, you're also causing a lot of damage to the microbiota, which is not good. So we repeated the strategy I showed you earlier. We went and looked for a new bacterius, and one that would kill C. diff, but would be very narrow spectrum. Now, Mary Ray did this work, and what she did was she isolated 50,000 individual spore-forming bacteria from the gut and tested every single one of them for anti-C. diff activity. This took years. And she didn't screen 50,000 because we picked 50,000 out of a hat. She screened 50,000 because it, she, it was 50,000 before she found one. So we've got one in the first 50,000 that we screened. So this is a very rare activity. And what she showed was that this particular strain, which was a Bacillus thuringiensis, can kill C. diff. And you see a huge zone of inhibition here. But interestingly, it's not killing the other bacteria from that same fecal sample. These are not resistant C. diffs. These are the other bacteria from that fecal sample. So it's, whatever it's producing is not killing the, the neighboring bacteria, but is only killing C. diff. And we purified it, and we um, solved the structure of that particular thing, which is called Taurus and C. D. It's a novel antibiotic, very highly specific against Clostridium difficile. We did, we did the exact same experiment again, this time looking and comparing Taurus and CD to the best available antibiotics, which are vancomycin and metronidazole. And vancomycin and metronidazole work very well to control C. diff in one of these colonic models. But in fact, Taurus and our new compound at equimolar amounts is just as effective as the, the frontline antibiotics. So that's good, but it's no better than vancomycin or metronidazole. Again, we have to look behind these headline figures to see what's going on in the microbiota. And what we can see is that the microbiota is very similar in these two control vessels. They were given by the same volunteer at a weak interval. Again, a devastating impact on the microbiota by vancomycin and metronidazole. Big explosion in the proteobacteria. But the real revealing result was when we used thoracin, we saw essentially no impact on the microbiota. So we can control the C. diff without damaging the rest of the microbiota. And this, I think, would give the patient, if it was a patient that was being treated here, a far better chance of recovery since their microbiota has not been damaged. Same, same thing works in a mouse model. We can show that thoracin also reduces um, lat C. diff in a mouse model, again, without disrupting the background microbiota. So we have a kind of a magic bullet. You can see here the zone of inhibition against Clostridium difficile, but absolutely no activity against any of the major commercial probiotics. So we could conceivably mix thoracin plus a probiotic and give it to a patient, kill the C. diff, and also deliver a, a therapeutic probiotic at the same time. So we can use pharmabiotics, probiotics, consortia, fecal transplants. What about bacteriophages? What about the viruses? And sometimes we forget about the viruses, but the viruses are even more popular, populous than the bacteria. There are about 10 to the 15 phages in your gut, the virome or the phageome. And these, of course, are very simple entities, biological entities. And the, the beauty of them is that every time a phage infects a, a target, it multiplies up to between 550 to 200 new phages per infection. So what you essentially get is if the target is present, the phage will multiply, generate more phage. So it's a, a reactive antimicrobial. If the target is there, it will multiply. If the target isn't there, it won't multiply. So it's a self-replicating narrow spectrum antibiotic. And we tested this against another organism that we were very interested in, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, because this is a superbug that infects the lungs, it's very antibiotic resistant, very mucoid colonies. And I'll just show you one very quick result. We went and looked for phage in the gut to kill Pseudomonas. We found the, those phage and we sequenced them, and these are just two of the phage that we found. And then we treat, we use the mouse model of infection. And what you can see here is on top, 
You've got the mice infected with the Pseudomonas aeruginosa. You can see the lungs are infected. They become more and more infected as time goes on. I'm just... They become more and more infected as time goes past. But the, the mice treated with the phage, the infection is eliminated over six hours. So we can actually treat uh, infected animals with phage derived from the gut. This movie here shows you C. diff, where phage are added. And here's the C. diff growing. And now the phage are added. You see the cells start to elongate and literally explode and disappear. So within a background of other bacteria, we can go in and specifically wipe out the C. diff without affecting the rest of the microbiota. And this is a phage that we've isolated against C. diff, not against uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And here's the same experiment done again, showing that C. diff grow in this in vitro co colon model. But when we add phage, the C. diff, immediately the numbers plummet. And of course, the phage numbers increase. So when you add the phage at low level and the bacteria at high level, they simply swap over and, and the phage go high and the bacteria go low. And so we're very interested in developing this. This is all unpublished work as well. So in conclusion, we believe that the gut microbiota really is a powerful player. And in this one particular disease, but we suspect for just about any disease uh, that we target associated with the gut microbiota, you can... Uh, you have a lot of different potential strategies. Fecal transplants, microbial consortia, probiotics, pharmabiotics, bacteriophages. So I'd encourage you to expand your thinking and when you're mining the gut microbiota for bioactives for use in health and in disease. I'd like to thank, of course, all my colleagues, the, my co-conspirators within the APC, Fergus Shannon, who's head of the APC. I'd like to thank the uh, foundation once again for inviting me uh, to come and, and speak to you. And I'd encourage you to go and look at our website, which is here. And uh, if you have any questions, you can put them through the website or you can ask me afterwards. And otherwise, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. There are any questions? I think we can take a few questions. Dr. Gandhi. Yes, Dr. Gandhi. Dr. Hill, how the phages were delivered? There is a company in India which is known as Ganga Gene, which uh, in Bangalore, which uh, deals with the phage mediated therapies. And uh, Russians did a lot of things at one time. But how did you deliver these phages to these mice? Uh, these ones were just simply delivered intranasally, just putting a drop on the nose and then the mouse breathes it in. But, uh, what, will you, what will be the mode of delivery if it is con converted a product for humans? If it was a human product, it would have to be some kind of nasal spray, I think, for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We've also delivered them orally. I didn't show you, but we have mice which have been infected gastrointestinally with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And when we put the, a drop of the phage on the back of the tongue of the, the mouse, then it completely wipes out the bacteria in the gut. So it doesn't seem to have problems getting through the stomach or... or doesn't seem to need encapsulation, at least in a mouse model. Yeah, um, I have a question. Uh, first of all, I would really like to appreciate your presentation. It was really wonderful. My question is that uh, the strains you have used for C. difficile uh, for uh, checking all these um, different modalities uh, were only um, novel strain ribotypo 27, or you also check the other strains which were like um, Cipra sensitive and um, commonly isolated because not yeah. everywhere we are getting this problem of uh, cipra resistant novel strains and my second question is because i expect there will be differential activity of these um, whether you use that um, you know extracts or the probiotic on the different strains and only one slide i could see that ribotype o27 but um, i'm not sure about what was done in other experiments we have tested against over 100 C. diff strains of, of many different ribotypes, and the activity is similar against all. We do not see a lot of strain variation. Thoracin in particular, the, the bactericin is effective against every C. diff we've ever tested it against. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, I have a question like regarding the specificity of thuricin. Do you know why it is so specific against C. difficile? And uh, my second question is regarding the phase therapy for pseudomonas. 
Do you get uh, escape mutants that have, you know, change restriction modification properties? Of With the first question, we do not know the mode of action of thoracin, but obviously we're very keen to learn that, and we have a lot of experiments in train to try and determine that. Uh, we've isolated some insensitive mutants, and we're now resequencing those to try and find out what the targets might be. For the phage, you will always get phage-resistant mutants of, if you expose any population to phage. Um, we're not looking for the perfect solution, we're just looking for a solution. So we feel that if you can reduce the numbers sufficiently, then you can probably uh, eliminate the pathogen through the immune system, through antibiotics. Um, so a system doesn't have to be perfect to be usable, I think. Thank you. Yeah, one, some, no, okay. So I think... Uh, so, yes, so thank you so much, Dr. Hill. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, it's, it's uh, I think we are looking at a new whole uh, generation of, hopefully, as Dr. Ranjit Roy Chaudhary started off with, ways of treating these conditions. Uh, and we'll all look forward to where it takes us in the coming years. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hill, and thank you, Chairpers. Uh, can I request Professor Ganguly to kindly felicitate Professor Ranjit Roy Chaudhary? And can I re request Professor Satoru Nagata, Professor Nagata, to kindly felicitate Professor Sita Naik? Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair. Now we move on to the last scientific session for the day. And can I request Professor Rakesh Tandon and Dr. Rekha Sharma to kindly chair the session. Professor Rakesh Tandon is the Medical Director and Head of Department of Gastroenterology, Pushpavati Singhania Research Institute for Liver, Renal and Digestive Diseases, New Delhi. He has received many national and international fellowships and is